All right, uh, game plan is to finish James. We almost finished two weeks ago, but I didn't, I didn't want to leave, uh, you know, I just like to finish it. So I'll, go th- I'll finish what we have. I wanted to go through the rest of the text. And then if, uh, depending how much time we have, I'm going to go back and, and just highlight some things uh, that I just wanted to pull out and mention again. You know, I've gone through everything, but I just wanted to go back. So depending on how much time we have, uh, I, I plan to do that. Now, you recall that in, in James chapter 5, verses 1 to 6, he announces the fate of the, of the wealthy unbelievers who are oppressing the poor. And he tells them this, they're pr- oppressing these poor Christians, their love of money, they're making an idol out of it that it will result in their condemnation. And this is part of the encouragement of those believers who are getting pounded That he lets them know that those who are mistreating and abusing you, those who've made an idol of wealth and because of that are willing to crush you, to deny you the wages and to cheat you and this kind of thing, that there is in store for them this horrific ending. Uh, And so it's that God will set all things right, so it's an encouragement to them. And he tells them that in 5, 1 to 6. And in 5, 7 to 11, he encourages them to stand firm during the oppression by the rich. And you know the thing about the farmer. That he looks forward, he waits. You know, that the crop is coming and he holds on and waits. And he's telling them to do that in the face of what they're enduring. Then in, in James chapter 5, verses 12 to 20, he gives them his concluding remarks. And in 5, 12, that's his instructions not to swear. And I mentioned to you, it makes sense to me that perhaps they were being uh, motivated to do that. Because if they're being pushed by... Uh, you know, wealthy people who have the juice in the legal system to cheat them. It may be that you're tempted then to say, no, listen, I swear, you know, uh, you see, trying to maintain your position against the injustice that wealth is purchasing. Now, that doesn't say that, I know that. But it just makes some sense to me that 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 could be what was motivating it and why James specifically tells them, reminds them, you know, he's there following the Lord's teaching in Matthew 5, 34 to 37 about swearing. And we talked about that uh, two weeks ago and and what's behind that. Then in in chapter 5, verse 13 to 18, he gives them instructions on suffering, cheer, and illness. And that's why I want to read that and pick back up there. He says in 5, 13, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him summon the elders of the church and let them pray over him, having anointed him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who was ill, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he may have committed sins, it will be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is very powerful in its working. Elijah was a man with the same nature as us, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its crop. So here in in 5, 13 to 18, he says they're to pray in suffering and to sing praise to God when they're cheerful. And we talked about that. And then in 5, 14, he says that the person who's so sick as to be laid out I mentioned that, you know, that this person seems to be, just be laid out, that he has to summon the elders. The person who's so sick is to be laid out that he should call the elders of the church to pray over him. And that's why I wanted to pick back up here this morning. It talks about olive oil, olive oil being used, and olive oil is to be applied by the elders in conjunction with their praying. And as I said, that oil, in this case, it may have been a sign or a symbol. You see, some kind of sign or symbol that the sick person's being set apart for God's special working. You know, it could be that or it could be, uh, you know, an expression of faith that the sick person will be returned to normal. I mentioned the brother who says, look, that this was kind of normal toiletry and so doing that, uh, it would be, in essence, you're saying, it's, it's my conviction that God is indeed going to raise me. But anyway, you have this oil that's being used that way and it's not, it's not something that's, it, it's not uh, being used uh, medicinally, okay, I'm, I'm pretty confident of that. Oil could be used medicinally, and it was used medicinally in the ancient world, but it doesn't seem to be that's what James is talking about. 
You see, and I think that because oil wouldn't be good medicine for every illness. I mean, it's not like, you know, a panacea. I just throw whatever it is, I throw oil on it, and that's going to have some kind of, uh, you know, adequate medicinal property for every illness. So that, that makes me think he's not talking about it medicinally. Anyone would be as suitable as the elders to apply a purely medicinal remedy. So that makes me think that he's, he's thinking about something other than that. And James indicates that it's prayer that saves the sick person and not the oil. You see, whether it, whether it be, uh, you know, via innate healing properties or through some sacramental power of the oil, he says, no, it's the prayer that saves the person. And then the anointing is in the name of the Lord, which suggests something beyond the innate healing powers of the oil is involved. It's in, it's in the name of the Lord. So it looks to me like some kind of symbol or sign that God is working in the life of this person, setting this person apart for his special work. Now the fact that the oil's probably not intended as medicine in this verse, that doesn't mean that it's wrong or unfaithful for Christians to use medicine when they're ill. Now that you may think, of course, that there's nothing wrong. But there are people that think that. You know, there are people that think that somehow if you use medicine, that you're being unfaithful to God because you're relying on these things instead of God. And I think that's a false dichotomy to look at it that way. 2 Kings chapter 20 verse 7 and Isaiah chapter 38 verse 21, Isaiah prescribes a poultice of figs for Hezekiah's boil. You see, he gives him something like that and figs were a known medicinal thing, so he prescribes a poultice of figs. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 5 23 to use wine medicinally because of his frequent illnesses. And part of the goodness of the good Samaritan in the Lord's parable in Luke chapter 10, part of that goodness was that he poured oil and wine on the wounds of the man who'd been beaten by the robbers. See, that was because that, there was a medicinal value to that. So it's not the case, you see, that somehow medicine is apart from the working of God. There's a second century uh, B.C. Jewish writing, Ecclesiasticus. I always say not Ecclesiastes. This is a... This is a, a, not a canonical book, Ecclesiast Ecclesiasticus, a Jewish writing. It's part of the Apocrypha, but still it's a second century B.C. Jewish writing. And it says, honor the physician with the honor due him according to your need of him. For the Lord created him. The Lord created medicines from the earth and a sensible man will not despise them. You see, and I look at this as God working through these things. You see, God can do what he wants, and if he chooses to work through these things, he can. So I don't see that, but yet you have people who will refuse medical treatment and let their child die. And I think it's just bad theology that's driving that. And they say, no, that would be unfaithful for me to do that. I'm just going to ask God. Well, God's given you this. Use it. You know, to me, it'd be like saying, I got peas here to eat, and I'm just not going to eat them because I want God to just sustain me. Right there. He's sustaining me with food. And I'm going to eat it. Why don't I just say that's unfaithful? Why do I need to eat? Just take care of me. Well, it seems to be presuming on God. All right, that's just a footnote. I just wanted to mention that. Now, verse 16, it indicates that praying for the sick is not limited to the elders. Right? I mean, praying for the sick is not limited to the elders. The elders praying over the extremely ill is simply, that's a specific case of healing prayer. The person who's laid out this person called the elders. We talked about, you know, the elders are spiritually mature Christians. The shepherds of the congregation, they come and pray. But that's just a specific case of healing prayer, which James, he then generalizes that. In verse 16, into a principle of healing for the congregation. Moose says in his commentary, he says, his focus is no longer on the specific case that he mentioned in verse 14. Is any one of you sick? But on the general need for the community to be involved regularly, the present tense of the imperative verb suggests this, in mutual confession and prayer as a way of treating cases of sickness that might arise. So here he's saying it's just not simply you know, something that's limited to the elders. It involves the congregation. And this shift from the elders to believers in general, it shows that the healing power is in the prayer. It's not in the elders. You see, it's in, it's in the prayer. So it's not that they are, you know, the special people only who can appeal to God. But it's in the prayer that is offered, that the elders offered. Now the second part of verse 15 
It shows that the sickness may be related to sin. Now, this kind of scares us, and we don't really like this, and we have ways of trying to dodge this. But it says that the sickness may be related to sin. In other words, the person may be experiencing the sickness because he's involved in sin. He may be experiencing the sickness because he's involved in sin. Now, we know from the book of Job, we know from Jesus in John 9, 2 and 3, that not all afflictions are the product of sin. We know that. Job, we're specifically told, is a righteous person. Is Job sinless? No, Job's not sinless. Nobody's sinless. But there is a relative level of righteousness that Job could be said he's a righteous person. What's that mean? He's a sincere, religious person who is sincerely living his life out in faith. And so we're told Job is a righteous person, and yet something happens to Job, tremendous suffering. Okay, so we know that not all afflictions are the product of sin. All right, that's important to understand. Not all of them are, but that connection between sin and illness and suffering, it remains a possibility. Look what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11. He tells the church in Corinth, he says, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord, Let a person examine himself then, and so eat the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Now, I'm not going to get into what all that means, but there's apparently stratification in the congregation. People are isolating themselves uh, on economic levels and class levels and dissing the other people. And so they're not honoring the unity that is the body of Christ. But he says, that is why many of you are weak and ill And some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we wouldn't be judged. But when we're judged by the Lord, we're disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So here's a situation where the church in Corinth is sinning in their division. And Paul says that because of that, he says, that is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. It is discipline from the Lord because of your sinful living. He is invading this world and getting your attention. It is a disciplinary measure. And he does that. Why? He says we're disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. That's what he's doing. So it it remains a possibility. Not all illness, all suffering, all that stuff. It is not all connected to sin. But it can be connected to sin. It can be disciplined for sin. See, so that's an important thing. That's an important thing for us to think about and recognize. Where where sickness is the result of sin, in that case, where the the sickness is the discipline of the Lord because of the sin in which the person's involved, he says that sin will be forgiven upon the sinner's confession of the sin and the prayer of forgiveness in which the sinner presumably joins with the elders or with the congregation. You see, so here it is, he comes and confesses this sin, and then they all together pray to God for forgiveness and for healing. And he says in that case, he says, where it's the result of sin, the sin will be forgiven. And the communal aspect, see this public confession and corporate prayer for forgiveness and healing, this communal aspect of it, It may be necessitated by the fact that sin is being disciplined by the Lord. Maybe that's the trigger of it. Where the sin, where the Lord has seen fit to discipline the sin by bringing illness. Well, that may be the trigger for the communal uh, involvement and the communal confession. So that we all then wind up uh, praying together on behalf of the, the now penitent brother or sister who has been disciplined because of their sin. This confession of sin in 1 John 1, 9, it doesn't specify that it's public. Okay, a lot of of scholars think that that's implied, but it doesn't specify it there. So, I I, I think it's important if you become ill, if something like this happens, if you become ill or or for that matter you experience any hardship in your life, If that happens to me, I need to examine my life honestly and see if the Lord is disciplining me. I never hear people talk about that. Nobody ever says it. But I need to look and see 
Is the Lord disciplining me? Now, I don't need to be neurotic about it. If I'm sitting here living with my girlfriend, if I'm, you know, stoning and getting drunk all the time, I'm stealing money from somebody. If I'm living in a way I know is sinful, I get sick, I need to ask, is the Lord saying, you see? You think he just he doesn't act? So that to me is the first thing I need to think about that and say, is, but I don't need to become neurotic about it and go, there has to be. Okay, I'm sick. I've got, there has to be. You just think about it. You would know, in fact. You would know, because it's been bugging you anyway that you've been living like that. You see? You don't have to sit here and say, well, you know, yeah, it's it's right. I I didn't say thank you to the grocer. Uh, You know, maybe that was unloving. Do you see? I, I don't want people to sit here and just become nutty about it. Because we know that that's not the case for all sin and suffering. I just want to have a note here that says, I at least should ask the question, is the Lord getting my attention? Is the Lord disciplining me for some sin in my life? You see, if I've fallen into a sin, I need to confess that sin to the church that we might pray as a community for forgiveness and healing. We oftentimes have people come and say, I would like somebody to pray for me. I never hear anybody come and say, I have been involved in sin and I'm repenting and I would like the church to pray for me. You see, I, I never hear that. Now, maybe we think, no, that, that's, you know, we don't think that way. We don't think that, that that God could ever discipline anybody by bringing that. I said, well, what, what was Paul talking about? Is it, you think it's beneath God to discipline people with illness? He did it, right? Okay, well, so, so that's all I'm saying. And I, you just never see that. And I think I just say we need to ask that question. Now, James says in verse 15... That the prayer of faith will save the one who is ill, and the Lord will raise him up. Now that's kind of puzzling, at least puzzling to me. Because he seems to say this unconditionally. You see, he seems to just assert this, that he will do it. He says the Lord will save the one who is ill, and the Lord will raise him up. But we know that Paul prayed three times for his thorn in the flesh to be removed. Right? He wasn't healed. We know that from Scripture, that he prayed that three times. You see, and and we know that he left Trophimus sick in Miletus in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 20. He had to leave him there sick. Okay, so it's, it's clear. It's clear from Scripture that sometimes it's not God's will to heal us physically. I mean, you can see that right from the fact that we all die unless the Lord returns before them. That confirms the point. I mean, that's like the ultimate illness. <laughs> you see? So it seem, it's clear that it's not always God's will to heal us physically. So what's going on? You see, how can James' apparently unconditional promise that God will heal one for whom the prayer of faith is offered be reconciled with the fact from both biblical testimony and personal experience we've all had people that many of us have prayed for who've died. I mean, I remember a friend of mine in, in uh, Steve Anderson, young guy, got some kind of rare form of stomach cancer. Our church was praying. We were fasting, all of that. And he died. And you all have, you all know uh, cases like that. So both from, from Scripture and from personal experience, we see that, you know, this, this, it's not always God's will. Well, how do you reconcile that fact with this apparently unconditional promise that God will heal. Well, let me give you some possibilities on what I think is going on. You know, it, it could be here in this case that it was understood that the prayer of faith includes an implied, not my will but yours be done. Okay, that's a possibility that that's an understood implication. In other words, when James says God will heal, he means assuming, of course, it's God's will to do so. Now, it's possible that that's what he's, what he's talking about. After all, it was James who He rebuked the wealthy believers, right? He was the one who rebuked the wealthy believers for not recognizing that whether they lived or did certain things, that that depended on what? The will of God. He just rebuked them for saying, today or tomorrow we'll go and do this and that. He said, you don't know anything about it. Your life and your future 
is in the hands of God. He is sovereign. He is the one who decides. So maybe it's implied there that he's talking about that. You know, now it's certainly true that all prayers are, are subject to the sovereignty of God. That, that's, that's true. But it just seems to me here that James is saying more than that. It seems like he's saying more than simply the Lord may heal you if he chooses to do so. I think that's important, but it just seems like he's saying he seems to be assuring them that the Lord will heal them at least normally. You know, at least normally. It seems that that's what he's saying. Now, maybe you don't think so, so. But there's that one possibility you can say, listen, maybe it's just implied that, that not my will but yours be done is inherent in what he's saying. Okay, it's an implication there. Maybe. All right. Another possibility is that he's promising his readers that God will at least normally heal them in response to their prayers. But his particular promise to them is not extended beyond th their time and their particular group. In other words, this may be that the Spirit has revealed to James that I am going to work that way for this particular community of believers as part of his public validation of the new Christian movement. Maybe James knows that. See, God is sovereign and he may have planned to, to work in a less striking fashion for some other groups and later on. I mean, that would at least be a logical possibility, just as the Spirit has changed the way he worked, at least in my judgment, in terms of how he works miraculously, right? I mean, I think there's been a change there, so maybe this is something like that. And the key would be is not that you just say, well, then are you just going to say that things in Scripture are limited to particular groups? Well, the key would be that Scripture itself suggests that the promise wasn't universal because we've got Paul, we've got Trophimus, we've got other people. You see, so we'd have a biblical reason for saying perhaps it was limited there, not just, well, this says that, that only applied to the first century. Okay? There's another possibility, and one that I find intriguing, and I think it might be correct. Okay, perhaps the prayer of faith to which James refers is not just what we would think of by a prayer of faith, meaning a prayer that's offered by somebody who's committed to God, you know, one who's not double-minded, like he said in chapter 1. You know, one who's a sincere believer and honestly trusts that God is there, that he's supreme, that he's sovereign, that he's loving. It may be something, see, something beyond that. It might be a prayer that's offered with a divinely given assurance that what the one is asking is in fact in this specific case in the will of God. So that would make it basically a term of art. You see a prayer of faith may be when it is given to this person by God this confidence and conviction that this specific request is in fact in the will of God and that being the case that it's going to be answered. Okay, I, I, I think there's something to that. Let me read to you what, uh, what Douglas Moose says about it. It's kind of a lengthy little quote here, but uh, maybe it'll convey this idea better than, than I can do it. He says, certain preachers and writers, he also has some cautions here that I think are worth hearing. He says, certain preachers and writers make a great deal of this call for faith, insisting that a believer simply needs to have enough faith in order to receive healing from the Lord. The devastating result of this line of thinking is that believers who are not healed when they pray must deal with a twofold burden. Added to the remaining physical challenge is the assumption that they lack sufficient faith. But this way of looking at faith and its results is profoundly unbiblical. And in James, at least, the prayer of faith that heals in verse 15 is offered not by the sufferer, but by the elders, verse 14. Are the elders therefore at fault when their prayer for healing does not bring results in a reasonable amount of time? Would the healing have taken place if they had just believed enough? Answering such a question involves us in the finely nuanced broader issue of the relationship between God's sovereignty and our prayers. But he says, but we can say this much. The faith exercised in prayer is faith in the God who sovereignly accomplishes his will. When we pray, our faith recognizes explicitly or implicitly the overruling providential purposes of God. We may at times be given insight into that will, enabling us to pray with absolute confidence in God's plan to answer as we ask. But surely these cases are rare, more rare even than our subjective emotional desires would lead us to suspect. 
A prayer for healing then must usually be qualified by a recognition that God's will in the matter is supreme. And it is clear in the New Testament that God does not always will to heal the believer. To ask in Jesus' name means not, means not simply to utter his name, but to take into account his will. Only those requests offered in that will are granted. Prayer for healing offered in the confidence that God will answer that prayer does bring healing. But only when it is God's will to heal will that faith itself a gift of God be present. In other words, it's like there are times when God conveys and gives to a person the confidence to know this is within the will of God and therefore because it is I can pray with that kind of confidence that I know it'll happen now uh, you know he says this is rare I think that's true now some years ago Crystal Moe was diagnosed out of the blue with a large tumor in her brain and uh, it would be hard to uh, we have a very deep attachment uh, many of us to Harry and Crystal, and it was a very uh, emotionally trying time, and many of us were praying for her uh, in the complete uncertainty, here's this large tumor, what's going to happen? And Brother John, he sent me a note and told me in essence that during his prayers, he was given confidence that everything would be fine. Now, that's not like John to do that. You know, we've prayed about many, many things together over the years, and so this was unusual. But he sent me a note and he said, I'm just telling you, I had a conviction, confidence that this is fine. And in fact, the, uh, the tumor was removed, it was benign, and Crystal suffered no impairment of any kind. And so, you know, that's the kind of thing that may be at work here. But there are a number of possibilities, I just wanted to throw them out to you because if you're reading this, you say... Uh, he seems really unconditional here. Like, well, maybe the condition's implied, maybe it's limited to them, or maybe it's this idea that this prayer of faith is really here, in essence, a term of art that refers to not the normal prayer of confidence by a person who is committed to God, who doesn't have one foot in the world, a person who that's a normal prayer of faith in that sense, but maybe this is this prayer of faith where God gives the person this conviction that it is, in fact, my will in this specific instance to grant that request. Okay, I just wanted to say that. Now, back to this. The power of prayer is something not to be underestimated. Look at look what he says here. The prayer of a righteous man is very powerful and it's working. We ask sometimes, you know, well, does prayer change anything? What do you mean, does prayer change anything? Yeah, I mean, if I can read... Yeah, it changes something, right? Of course, John and I for years have joked about this, said the prayer of a good-looking man is powerful and effective. You don't know why we'd be saying that. But, but what it says here, all right, the prayer of a righteous man is very powerful and it's working. Elijah was a man with the same nature as us, and he prayed earnestly that it wouldn't rain, and it didn't rain on the land for three and a half years. Is that power? Here is Elijah praying, and the, the heavens closed for three and a half years. Does prayer make a difference? Yeah, he says, then he says, he prayed again and heaven gave rain and the earth produced its crop. So prayer is something that is very powerful and is not to be underestimated and we are to be engaged in it. It's sometimes, you know, it's easy to, to forget that and to get discouraged when God's working doesn't fit what we want. You know, when you pray and pray for somebody and you'd like them to be healed and they die. When you pray and pray for this door to open and the doors close. When you do this and that, it's easy to get discouraged and to start feeling in your heart, you know, it doesn't really matter if I pray. Well, that's a lie. You see, that's a lie. We need to be praying. There are times, look, when we don't understand what God is doing, but why does that surprise us given who God is? You see, he's just complete, this spirit being, this infinite spirit being. You see? Why do we think that we've got him wired that we can know what he's doing? All right, well, there are a lot of times when you pray, all you can say is, all right, I ask God for this, and okay, God's answer is apparently no, as we were talking on last Wednesday. You know, yes, no, wait, got something else for you, got something better for you. You know, I remember this, uh, I think McGuigan has this, uh, illustration the little kid goes into the store and he's with his mom and she has in mind to buy him something really great 
he takes him into this like five and dime store and little kid seizes on the first you know shiny object here i want this i want this no 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 goes to the next one oh, i gotta have this gotta have this no 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 he starts crying now and he's pitching a fit gets to the next thing yes i want this he says no 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 not that and he's ah you know he's just like losing his mind you hate me you hate me finally takes her back there and and the child sees what she had in mind oh, you see then they understood all of these things had a purpose you see that the child would have no idea and couldn't understand anyway maybe that'll help you all right he says in 19 and 20 my brothers if anyone among you should wander from the truth and someone turns him that turns him back know that the one who turns a sinner from the error on his way will turns him from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins James urges his readers to turn those who have wandered from the truth back to the right path. You see, back to the right way of life. That is not something mean. That is not something, you know, bossy or nosy. Or, it is what we're called to do as Christians because we love each other. You see, he says you are to take those who are off the path, those who have turned away, wandered from the truth, and you are to turn them back to the right path. See, those who'd wandered into hostility, anger, favoritism, various sins of division that he's been addressing, see, they were in danger of what? They were in danger of condemnation. They're just bopping along, ignoring the will of God, living the way they want. James writes them and says, you need to knock it off. You need to stop it. And he tells us you see, that we are to be instruments of helping bring that about. We are to help those who've wandered from the truth turn back to the right way of life. What does that mean? We need to get them to stop living contrary to how God would have them live and to turn back. St knock off the favoritism. Knock off the hostility. Knock off the evil speech. Knock off the sins of division. All of those things. You need to stop it. You see, we help each other. Now, we don't like saying that to somebody because they are, the reaction we fear is that, who do you think you are? Well, I think I'm a sinful brother of yours who loves you enough to try to help you. That's what I think. I'm trying to help you. And so we sometimes get intimidated. You see, if they're successful, he says, if you succeed in that effort, they'll deliver the erring brother from eternal death. He says, know that the one who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death. They will, they will save this person. They will deliver this erring brother from eternal death, covering with atoning blood a multitude of his sins. And will cover a multitude of sins. That means covering atoning blood. That here is this person who is off the path, turned away, over here. You help the person come back to faithfulness to Christ. Okay. Well, then what happens? Then as he limps along in sin, he's just covered. Over here, he's in rebellion. Over here, he's in the blood. Okay, that's what, that's what the idea is about, I think. Okay, we have all of five minutes. And I'm going to, let me, let me mention some things that I've talked about before. Just to highlight some things in the book. Uh, I know how this is, because in a week you won't remember a thing about this class. That's just, the, that's just the way it is. That's, uh, I remember Ken Fox, he, he had a statistic one day that people, he, people remember like, you know, 1% of what's said to them, 2% of what they grab. I don't, I don't remember what it was, but I was saying, oh man, that's discouraging. But anyway, let me, just, let me just remind you some of the things. Number one is that we need to encourage one another to faithfulness during struggles and difficult times. I mean, James does this in the first part of chapter one. See, when we're having struggles and difficult times, being oppressed or whatever, or just hardships, we need to help one another. We can't be isolated from one another and just say, okay, you know, you just sit over here and you just go ahead and go out. You see, we can't do that. We have to encourage one another, be a help to one another. That's how a body functions, you see. It's not just independent little pieces stuck together like little ball bearings. It's networked, right? It's all connected. And that's how we need to be. Second, we have to be careful not to slander God when we're suffering. 
he, by claiming that he's our enemy or that he's seeking to harm us in some way. And that is a temptation because he is all powerful. Why in the world would this be happening to me? And it is easy to start to perceive God as an enemy and as a hostile character. And we have to be careful about slandering him and saying, he's not, he's not out for my interest. Not at all. He's an enemy. He's seeking to destroy me, and that's what he's about. You see, that's not, uh, that's not something that we need to be... To, we, we have to avoid that. Thirdly, it says, hardships and trials provide no excuse for not being doers of the word. And I just think this is important. No excuse for not being doers of the word... For not living the noble life that Christ calls us to live. I've mentioned many times in the class how I was struck by, here are people who are really having a difficult time. And yet James doesn't rush to that and try to justify their sin by saying, I understand because you're having a difficult time. He says, difficult time aside, in essence, you are called to walk on the high path. So you are called to be this kind of person. And yes, I'm aware of your suffering. I'm aware of the difficulty of being faithful in your particular circumstance. But you can never allow that to justify your lack of faithfulness. And so he calls them. And I mean, he calls them like ways that get him run out of most churches. You know, where he sits here and says, you have, you have to be this way. You got to knock it off and be this way. You have to repent. And so he calls them to live like that. Now, another thing is a mere intellectual assent to propositions about God the Father and about Jesus Christ is not what is meant by biblical faith and is inadequate for salvation. Simply understanding the truth of intellectual propositions. I am convinced this fact is true. Simply understanding that the belief of these propositions or having mental assent to certain propositions is not adequate for salvation. See, the faith that saves involves a surrender of the will, a commitment to live in accordance with one's belief. If you simply have the intellectual assent, if that's all you've got, you see, uh, you're, that's not biblical faith because biblical faith, James says, is something that involves a surrender that will inevitably find expression in your life. And that just makes perfect sense to me. As I said, there are anything, like if you said somebody, he's committed to communism. He believes that is the truth, that is the reality. Or they're committed into the environmental agenda. I don't care, you pick it. If somebody's really committed to something, you will see it in their lives. You can't say, oh yeah, I'm down with that communist stuff. I'm all for it. I'm living for it. That's it. You look around and say, well, you don't look, you're completely the same as somebody who doesn't know a thing about it. You would say, okay, there's something wrong. Well, this is how Christianity is. How can you expect that a person who says Jesus is Lord and means it will not have that expressed in their life? That's crazy. And James says it's crazy in, in different ways. Now, teaching in the Lord's church is another point is that it's serious responsibility. Okay, not to scare people off and all that, but simply to get them to take it seriously because it has a tremendous influence on the congregation. And one of the weaknesses, I think, in churches over years is the teaching. I, you know, maybe I'm alone. Maybe I'm just crazy about that. But it takes a lot of work. And we spend all of our time working, doing other things. And if you spend time doing this thing, you say, why are you doing that? I told you, I went to graduate school of religion. I had a friend of mine laugh at me. He said, what in the world? Why would you want to do that? You can just read the Bible. Well, <laughs> anyway, I won't get into all that. But uh, I, I got to tell you, there's a lot out there. There's a lot to learn, you see. And it just, it just has to be taken seriously, that's all. It can't be done, you know, seat of the pants, fly by junk. It has to be done with a lot of struggle and wrestling, okay? And then that, it's an important thing because it, it's, it has an influence on the church. All right, there's no place in the family of God for hostility, envy, rivalry, conflicts, quarrels, or slander. There's no circumstances excuse that or justify it. And yet it is rampant. 
right? It's rampant. And the Bible is just flat, clearly, James is saying flat, clearly it is inexcusable. Why doesn't that prick any hearts? That's what I want to know. Why doesn't that prick any hearts so that people wind up saying, oh, I've been that way. Oh, forgive me. It's just like, yeah, okay. I hear those words. Rah, 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 rah. You see? That's an important thing, though. There's no place for those things, and I did hear that bell. Uh, next week, we'll take a look at what I mentioned. Thanks.